All right, gang, here we go. So this is Chem 1, Unit 4, Part 4. We're talking about polarity today, polarity. All right, um, so now remember, we before we've talked about two different types of bonds, right? We've talked about ionic bonds, and then we've talked about covalent bonds. Right? There's lots of things that you need to know about each of those types of bonds, but essentially what we want to focus on right now is what's happening with the electrons. So remember in ionic bonds, this happens between a metal and a nonmetal, and the metal gives up its electron to the nonmetal. Okay? So really the electron is um, given away or taken. Um, given or taken. Okay? So it's just given up. Whereas in a covalent bond, the electrons are shared. Now, the key here is that when two elements share electrons, they don't necessarily share them equally, okay? Um, so one electron based on their electronegativity. Now remember, electronegativity is the ability of an, of an atom to attract an additional electron. So based on their electronegativity, they can attract uh, more or less of that pair that they're sharing, or two pairs or three pairs, depending on if they have a single, double, or triple bond, okay? So if they're being shared equally, if those electrons are being shared equally, we call this a nonpolar bond, okay? Nonpolar or co uh, nonpolar covalent bond, because the electrons are still being shared, but they're not being shared equally. So uh, it's or they're in a nonpolar. Excuse me. In the nonpolar bond, they are being shared equally. In a polar bond, these electrons are being shared unequally. Okay, and so these electrons. Um, they're still being shared, right? That's why we call it a covalent bond, but they're not being shared equally, and so that's where the nonpolar part comes in. Okay, and it's all based on their electronegativity. The more electronegative, uh, the more of a difference there is between the two electronegative atoms, the more uh, the electrons will be pushed from one side to the next. So it's all based on their electronegativity difference, all right? And by difference, remember this essentially means subtraction, all right? Um, so we're going to just simply subtract the electronegativity of the two elements that are being bonded together. And based on that number of the difference, that's whether or not they're polar or nonpolar. Okay? So here's your ranges. Uh, anything less than 0.4 is nonpolar covalent. All right? So that means it's a nonpolar bond. Okay? If your difference is, so this, should, this symbol should really be like a... Um, Let's see, it's kind of backwards. It should be like this. Less than, greater than or equal to 0.4, but uh, less than 1.7, then um, it, you have a polar bond. You could also, like I've seen some, this number's kind of fuzzy. Um, I think on the back of our pink sheet, it's labeled as a 2.0. Don't be, get too hung up about it, all right? And then anything greater than whatever that high number is, and we'll just stick with 2.0 because I think it's a better number. But anyway, uh, we'll say that's an ionic bond, all right? So that's what we're kind of looking at. So if our number is between 0 and 0.4, it's nonpolar. If it's between 0.4 and 1.7, then it's polar, and anything greater than that is ionic. All right, so uh, where do we get these numbers? Well, you'll have in your note packet, this table here is all the electronegativity values. It's also called a Pauling scale of all these different elements. Okay, so you just find the elements and subtract the big one minus the small one. So here we've got uh, nitrogen and hydrogen. So the two bonds are gonna be between the nitrogen and the hydrogen. So we take the value for nitrogen, which is three, and the value of hydrogen, which is 2.1. So we take uh, 3.0, minus 2.1 and we get a difference of 0.9 okay so 0.9 that means it's falling between the 0.4 and the 1.7 so this guy here would be a polar covalent bond all right polar covalent all right uh, between carbon and hydrogen we'll just do these real quick these are pretty easy carbon is 2.5 hydrogen is still 2.1 so it's uh, 2.5 minus 2.1 so this is a 0.4 so this would still be polar although it's like a really, really, really nonpolar polar bond. Okay, um, like 0.4 is just not much to write home about. It's still defined as a polar bond, but it's it's not really all that much. All right, uh, and then sodium fluoride. Well, we should be able to do this one without even doing the math. We know sodium is a metal, right? It's on the left hand side of the periodic table, and fluorine is a nonmetal. Okay, it's on the right hand side of the periodic table, and we know whenever a metal and a nonmetal get together, this is always an ionic bond. But we can go ahead and do the numbers anyway. Okay, so fluorine is 4 and sodium is 0.9. Okay, so we'll take uh, 4.0 minus 0.9 and we get uh, 3.1. And we say that's greater than our 2.0 here. So this would be an ionic bond. Okay, pretty snazzy. All right.
So here's just a representation of what these different, uh, these polar, nonpolar things look like. So we've got our atoms and they're in here, the nucleus, right? Oop. So this is our nucleus right here, and this is our nucleus of chlorine. And then we've got the electrons that surround the nucleus. All right, so these are the electrons that are around our chlorine atoms. And so in a nonpolar bond, remember chlorine minus chlorine, well, this would be an electronegativity difference of zero. So this would be nonpolar, right? Because anything less than 0.4 is nonpolar. And so this would be a, a nonpolar covalent bond. These electrons are being equally shared because they have equal electronegativities. And notice that the electron, this gray cloud area, this is the shape that the electron makes or the, the electron density, sorry, the shape of the electron density. Like it's kind of shared equally between the two things. It's just kind of two spheres that are uh, butted up next to each other, right? Now in a polar covalent bond, we know that hydrogen and chlorine, well, chlorine has an electronegativity of three, hydrogen's 2.1, so they have a difference of 0.9, so they are also polar. So this is a polar covalent bond. All right, and so what we see is like the shape of our cloud here is really tiny on the hydrogen side and much, much bigger on the chlorine side. So you see there's fewer electrons over here on the left-hand side and many more uh, electron, uh, a much higher probability of finding the electrons on the right-hand side. All right, so this is what kind of makes this have a polarity to it. All right, now this symbol here is a, stands for delta. It's a Greek letter. It means, like I think of it as saying like partial. Okay, so this is saying there's a partial positive charge on the left-hand side because there's a distinct lack of electrons to balance out the nucleus. And over here, we have a partial negative charge because there's an excess of electrons on this side um, because it's being pulled over to the right by the electronegative chlorine. All right, so these electrons are being shared unequally, and so we get a positive charge on one end and a negative charge on the other. This guy here is an ionic bond, right? Sodium and chlorine is metal and a nonmetal. Now notice that these electrons are not being shared. The sodium literally gave up its electron to the chlorine, and they're being attracted to each other simply because the sodium is positively charged and the chlorine is negatively charged. So notice that there's no partials on these. This is a straight up, this sodium is positively charged, and straight up, this chlorine is negatively charged. All right, so there's this complete transfer of electrons. So it's a, it's a totally different beast, but very similar to a polar covalent bond, right? We've got a definitive positive and a definitive negative side. However, these can be split up by dissociation by water, and we'll talk about that in a couple of units. But anyway, but in a polar covalent bond, you get this, these two sides to it. So in a polar covalent bond, okay, uh, the electrons will be closer to the electronegative atom. Okay, and we call this, when this occurs, is called a dipole. Now remember, di means two, and so it's really saying there's two poles. So there's, there's a polarity, two poles of this guy. All right, so it's called a dipole. All right, one side is positive and one side is negative, and they always have to come in that pair, one positive, one negative. All right, okay, um, the more electronegative atom will always have the slight negative, and the other one will always have the slight positive charge, and we use this symbol. Uh, like this to represent it, all right? And we put a negative if it's negative, to partial negative, positive if it's partial positive. The other way we can do it is with arrows. With an arrow, you draw an arrow pointing towards the side with the electrons, and then you put a plus on the positive side. So like, so uh, this would correlate like this, all right? Those mean the two same things. So partial positive would be on this side of the arrow, partial negative would be on this side of the arrow. Most of the time you do one or the other, sometimes both. Um, it doesn't really matter so much. All right, so let's look at water real quick. So water is interesting. If we were going to do the electron dot structure of water, then um, you know that uh, you've probably done this a couple of times now, that water's electron dot structure would look something like this, right? Based on what we've done before. And um, based on the last video, you know that water here has a bent structure. All right. So water's bent. Now, we haven't drawn it bent here, right? It looks linear. So let's draw it bent and see what we get. All right, so we've got hydrogen, oxygen, and then hydrogen, and then it's got two lone pairs here, all right? So we've got this water molecule. Not my best water molecule I've ever drawn, but it's all right, okay? Now, let's figure out whether or not these bonds are polar. So we got hydrogen and oxygen. All right, hydrogen is 2.1, oxygen is 3.5, so they've got a difference of uh, 1.4, right? So they've got a difference of 1.4, which puts them in a polar, uh, polar bond, all right? So these guys here are polar, so let's see if we can get a cool color. 
All right. So uh, that means we've got a polar bond. Now, now which side is going to be positive and which side is going to be negative? Remember, the more electronegative atom is always the negative side. In this case, it's the oxygen. So we're going to point our arrow towards the oxygen because that's going to be our negative side. And you should be able to tell that these are going to be the same, right? And you're going to be pointing this way as well. All right. Uh, so the electro, the oxygen, because it's so electronegative, is going to be pulling electron density towards it. Okay. So um, you can imagine that if we took and we drew a line across the middle of this guy. Oh, where did my pen go? The green's really hard to see. If we drew a line like across this guy, we could see that on one side with the hydrogens, we got a definitive partial positive charge. And on the side with the oxygen, we have a definitive partial negative charge. So we get this dual, dual nature, one positive on the bottom, one negative on the top. All right, And so you've probably heard, uh, maybe in biology or another class, you've heard the fact that water is polar. right? Um, so that's kind of where we get that idea. Uh, or that's where it comes from is that it's because of its shape that uh, because it's bent it's got those na those electron pairs that are hanging up off the top that are very very polar put that negative part on it and pull electrons away from the hydrogen um, and so you get this polarity okay uh, so water is polar because of its shape right um, so remember a couple of slides ago we talked about, I don't really like the green, so I'm going to go back to red. So anyway, so remember a couple of slides ago here, we looked at hydrochloric acid, HCl here, and we saw that it was polar because the hydrogen is much less electronegative than the chlorine. This is just kind of another way of recognizing what's going on here. Uh, the ice cream uh, scoops are electrons, okay, and then you've got the polar bear is chlorine, and the hydrogen is the penguin, and the chlorine, uh, the polar bear is the chlorine, and he was pulls on the ice cream balls or the ice cream scoops so a lot harder than the penguin because he's a lot stronger, okay, and the hydrogen is like, hey, whatever, man. So anyway, so you can kind of visualize that the chlorine is going to be stealing, and uh, even though they're sharing the ice cream, the chlorine is certainly going to have a lot more of it than the hydrogen or than the hydrogen is. Um, it's kind of fun. Okay, so if water wasn't polar, if it was linear, then uh, that means that it would not have this positive negative end to it, right? So if we drew it again, now remember this is not how water actually looks, right? But if we drew it this way, we can't really draw a division line where we get one side positive and one side negative because the positive would be over here and over here, and then this guy would be negative in the middle, right? And we can't really like it. We always have to draw our line through the middle. If we did this, we'd never end up with uh, a polar, uh, like that polarity that's going on. Um, so the, the fact of the matter is, is that the geometry chase plays a huge part in the polarity. Okay? Um, if it's, most of the time, if you have a bent molecule, you're going to end up with a polar molecule. And if you have a linear molecule, it's going to be uh, nonpolar. And, but it also just kind of depends on what's being connected. You kind of got to be smart about it. So let's do a couple here together. So let's try CO2. Now this guy's, this guy's super tricky. So let's try, uh, let's walk through everything together. So CO2. So it's got uh, so carbon and two oxygens, and we're going to add up those valence electrons. So we got a, far, a four for the carbon valence electrons. We've got two uh, sets of oxygen. They have six. So here we've got uh, two times six is twelve plus four. So we got sixteen electrons for our, for our electron dot structure. All right. Um, so we'll put that to the side. All right. So. Uh, carbon, we'll put the carbon with the oxygen and the oxygen. And now we're going to give everything a full octet, remember? So we decided carbon would be in the middle because it's the least electronegative out of the oxygens and all that jazz. All right, so now we've got this guy. Now we count up how many electrons we've got going on. Uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20. Ah, I've used way too many. I've used four too many, which means I either need two double bonds or a triple bond. So we'll just go ahead and do two double bonds. Makes so we get this nice symmetrical molecule here. All right, so here we go. So we've got uh, our Lewis dot structure for carbon. And we know this is correct because we've used 16 electrons, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16. And everything has a full octet. Each oxygen has 8, and the carbon has 8. Okay, so we've got our valence structure here. We could draw resonant, or our Lewis dot structure. We could draw resonance structures of this pretty easily just by moving that double bond, making a triple bond on one side or the other. Um, <clears throat> so that's that. Now, now let's figure out what the the um, 
uh, the geometry is of this molecule. All right. So let's see how many electron domains are there around this car uh, this carbon here. Well, we've got uh, a bonding region right here and a bonding region right here, but no lone pairs. So we've got two electron regions. Two of them are bonding regions, and zero of them are lone pair regions. So this means this guy has to be. If you look at your chart there, this would be a linear molecule. All right. So carbon dioxide is linear. All right. Now. Um, now, because it's symmetrical, we can say for sure right now that it's pol or it's nonpolar. But I want you to look at something real quick. Let's figure out it, whether or not this bond is polar. All right. So carbon oxygen. So if we go back here, carbon is uh, 2.5, oxygen is 3.5. So that means they have a difference of one. And remember, one puts us firmly in the polar covalent area here. Okay. So that means. We know for sure that this bond here between the carbon and the oxygen is polar, as is the bond between the carbon and the oxygen on the other side. All right, and if we were going to draw this out, remember the so which is going to be more, which one's going to have the electrons? Well, it's going to be the oxygen because it's more electronegative. So we get this, so it's going to look something like this, right? But on the other side, it's also going to look something like this. All right, so you get uh, this separation of the charge, where you've got, uh, you know, one end of the molecule has a bunch of electrons, the other end of the molecule has a bunch of electrons, and the middle is electron deficient. There's not as many electrons in the middle. So this guy here, because of its geometry, is actually a nonpolar molecule, right? So if we were going to draw uh, the electron cloud that kind of forms around, or the electron density that forms around carbon dioxide, it would look something kind of like this. All right, so it'd be, you know, around that side, and then it'd be a little bit skinnier in the middle, and then, you know, I'm not the best artist, but notice that these guys here, the the electron density should be pretty much even. There's not one side that's negative, definitively negative, and one side that's definitively positive. So even though, so this is kind of tricky, even though carbon dioxide has polar bonds, it is a nonpolar molecule. All right, pretty wild. All right. So here, here's another little graphic kind of explaining what's going on. So you got carbon in the middle. That's the penguin. And notice that they're sharing. he's sharing four ice cream scoops on both sides. That's because it's a double bond on both sides. Pretty slick, huh? I think that's really clever. So, uh, you know, there's four electrons going on either side. Anyway, and then you got the oxygens. Once again, those are the polar bears. They're pulling on the ice cream a lot harder than the carbon is of that penguin. And so these, but because the carbon is being split evenly both ways, there's no definitive polarity to its mo to its bonds. Pretty funny. All right. So let's do one more, and um, and we'll define whether or not. Uh, H2S is polar. All right, so let's draw out the structure for H2S. So sulfur is right under oxygen. So we got, all right, let's do everything that we always do here. So sulfur is six, and then we got two times one for the hydrogen. So that means we've got uh, eight. I don't know why. So eight electrons, okay? Um, so sulfur is going to go in the middle because hydrogen never can. All right, and we'll do this, and we'll put our lone pairs here, and we use two, four, six, eight. Oh, we're good. All right. So two, four, six, eight. Now you should know that this has four electron domains, and two of them are bonding. Two are lone pairs. So this guy, so he's bent, all right. So this this guy's bent. Um, and so really, if you redraw it, just like the water, you know, so it'd be like this, and we'd have our lone pairs like that. Now he's bent, right? And so it's the same thing as water. We've got one side that's got all the electrons over here. We've got this partial negative. We've got one side that's got all the pos positive. This would be partial positive. So the this guy would be polar, right? H2S is a polar molecule. <clears throat> so essentially, here's kind of your guideline of looking to decide whether or not a molecule is polar. So first, decide whether or not you have polar bonds. All right. Now this isn't definitive proof. Like you can have a polar molecule that has nonpolar bonds. All right. So you gotta. So that's only one step along the way. Then you gotta really look at the geometry of the molecule because that's really where the polarity is going to come into play. Is your does the pol does the geometry lend itself to being polar or not? All right, and then you're going to look at the distribution of lone pairs. You know, so like here on H2S, the lone pairs. So you had the bent geometry, and the lone pairs were all at the top. All right, and so you get a definitive. You know, this side has a bunch of extra electrons. This side does not, and so we get this negative up on the top. All right. So anyway, so that's polarity. Uh, next video, we'll be talking about. Uh,
we'll be talking about um, intermolecular forces and uh, fun stuff like that. So make sure you really understand polarity so intermolecular, intermolecular forces will go a little bit easier for you. Uh, do your practice problems? Let me know if you have any questions.